Hello and welcome. The Provincial Council for Maternal and Child Health, otherwise known as PCMCH, released a safe administration of oxytocin guideline report in 2019, outlining best practice recommendations to standardize practice and in turn promote safe induction and augmentation of labor across the province. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mark Walker to provide a brief overview. Mark expertly co-led this initiative at PCMCH for the past few years and has a wealth of expertise and experience in this sector, as you can see by his credentials and various appointments. I'll hand it over to you, Mark. Oxytocin is a peptide that is naturally produced by the posterior hypothalamus. It binds to uterine receptors that stimulate smooth muscles of the uterus to produce contractions. Synthetic oxytocin is routinely used in Canada to induce labor in patients, to augment labor, and in the active management of the third stage of labor to decrease bleeding and the potential for hemorrhage. When used inappropriately or in excess, adverse effects may include impaired blood flow to the uterus, uterine tachycystole, uterine rupture, postpartum hemorrhage, and fetal hypoxia and acidosis. This mismanagement leads to induction and augmentation liability claims. And in fact, <clears throat> in a 2018 report from Hiroc and CMPA, notes that obstetrics is one of the highest risk clinical areas accounting for 45% of Hiroc and 25% of CMPA liability costs. This report provided contributing factors leading to these claims and suggesting mitigating strategies such as standardizing use, applying clinical decision supports, and proper labeling. The Safe Administration of Oxytocin Guideline Report incorporates many of these suggested strategies. There are 11 best practice recommendations made within the report. There are a number of associated tools and new imp implementation toolkits available. We will briefly review each recommendation. Patients are provided with information to participate in shared decision-making on oxytocin induction, augmentation, and expectant management. The primary healthcare provider should fully engage with the patient to ensure they're making an informed decision, consent to the birthing plan to include oxytocin. Reviewing the questions listed on the slide can support this conversation. What is oxytocin being recommended to augment or induce? What is the patient experience during the oxytocin infusion? How does using oxytocin benefit the patient? What are the risks are there when using oxytocin? Fully engagement in this birth planning process is crucial and having informed decisions and documentation of this should be in the patient's chart. Members of the healthcare team must maintain communication that is clear, direct, and respectful. In 2018, HIROC and CMPA report, they identified poor communication as a leading cause of oxytocin mismanagement. Therefore, this recommendation focuses on creating an environment where all members can openly discuss the appropriateness of an oxytocin order, how it is being titrated, and the effects. Regardless of their role, each healthcare professional is accountable for the care that they provide. The prescriber will order oxytocin for induction and or augmentation for the appropriate indications. This requires sound clinical judgment that should be used to determine if the induction, indication for induction augmentation with IV oxytocin will improve birthing outcomes. Ultimately, the expected benefits need to be outweighed against the harms. The full guideline report provides guidance on methods to help determine the appropriateness of induction of or augmentation of labor uh, reminds readers that IV oxytocin is not appropriate ripening agent and less common drugs that should be administered with oxytocin or within the described buffer time. Oxytocin is prescribed and administered by trained healthcare professionals educated in its use, including the effects and risks of drug administration. Once again, Oxytocin is a high alert medication and in such there's significant risk of harm if it's given by those who do not have knowledge, skill and or judgment to use it appropriately and safely. 
Therefore, it needs to be ensured that all professionals prescribing, administering, and monitoring oxytocin infusion have demonstrated knowledge, experience, and training to ensure it's done safely. The guidance report suggests specific knowledge areas for professionals to focus on. Specifically, fetal surveillance should be part of this training and recommended that all health professionals complete fetal health surveillance training every two years. Administration of oxytocin will occur in hospitals where interventions are readily available to manage potential adverse effects. HIROC, in fact, identified obstetrical incidents that occurred during interpartum fetal surveillance from 2004 to 2013. 18% were precipitated by a reduced capacity to respond to obstetrical emergencies due to lack of staff availability. Lack of OR availability represented 11% of these incidents. Oxytocin is stored safely and labeled appropriately. Both the ISMP and Health Canada recommendations, the standardization of drug labels to help reduce the chances of mixing warning labels, miscommunication, or product mix-ups. Oxytocin is no exception. We want to ensure oxytocin is kept safe in a secure location, regularly checked by pharmaceutical staff for stock and expiry dates, stored at a safe temperature. Standardized medication labels can support prevention of errors, including providing the incorrect drug or a drug at the incorrect concentration to a patient. An example of a standardized medication label is provided in the guideline report and in the implication toolkit. Each hospital will use a standardized oxytocin protocol and order set. This recommendation focuses on the fact that well-designed order sets contribute to good patient care. And their creation is achievable by considering certain criteria from the best available evidence. Prescribers of oxytocin must sign an order set indicating the practice of preparing, monitoring, and interviewing during administration. Knowledge, skill, and judgment should always be used by those administering and monitoring the use of oxytocin, despite how routine of a practice and procedure it may seem. A sample order set is found within the guidance document. Independent double check to be obtained in preparing the medication and setting up the initial pump infusion rate via a smart pump. An independent double check requires that two individuals separately and independently of each other check a process in the workflow. You want to be, ver you want to be verifying factors such as having the correct patient, initial order, infusion bag, and initial pump setting. This aligns with ISMP's recognition that there are concerns with dose expression and a recommendation for having independent double checks for program medication pumps. The use of a smart pump technology can also reduce medication errors and support the process of continuous quality improvement. Hospitals administering oxytocin for the purpose of augmentation induction will follow a low dose order to support safe administration. There are many reasons that support this approach. Number one, oxytocin is a hormone and does not react with a typical dose response as other medications do. It has a slow dilution rate. So if increased too quickly, it can have an unpredictable and unsafe results. The regime recommended in the sample order set outlines a concentration of 10 units of oxytocin in 500 milliliters of isotonic solution. This requires only one ampule of the drug to be used and minimizes opportunities for error in preparation of the medication and wastage. In addition, limiting the concentration and increasing the rate slowly by one to two milliunits per liter per minute, sorry, will reduce chances of adverse events and is most appropriate for a low risk patient. Special circumstances and individual patient cases may exist and therefore variation in this protocol is reasonable. Ensure the indication is justified and documented in the patient's chart. Healthcare providers are to be aware of when to stop, reduce, and safely restart oxytocin administration. In 2018 report from Hiroc and CMPA states that one of the common claims when discussing the mismanagement of IV oxytocin was failing to reduce or discontinue the infusion rate in the presence of maternal or fetal complications. Outlined in the guidance document are different indications for reducing or stopping infusion. The infusion should be reduced or stopped in the presence of satisfactory uterine activity, 
in the event of an atypical fetal heart rate and or in the event of tachycystole without fetal heart rate changes. The infusion must be stopped in the event of an abnormal fetal heart rate or in the presence of tachycardia with atypical abnormal fetal heart rate changes. Once oxytocin induction or augmentation have been initiated and an ideal concentration pattern have been achieved, failure of subsequent labor progression over an appropriate time period should lead to operative delivery rather than more oxytocin. Team communication is outline and recommendation Recommendation number two is extremely important during this time. Pregnant patients in labor receiving an oxytocin infusion will receive continuous one-to-one -one care by a registered healthcare professional support, advocacy, comfort measures, and monitoring. Patients receiving oxytocin must have one-to-one -one midwife or nurse-to-patient ratio for continuous support in labor. While there's limited evidence to show that the suggested ratio improves perinatal outcomes, other benefits have been reported, such as decreased need for oxytocin, an elevated appreciation of patient safety, shorter labors, and the family's increased satisfaction with the birthing experience. From a practical standpoint, sites should be cognizant of their allocation of resources and staffing availability when determining patient acuity for oxytocin administration. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, if you're interested in accessing the safe administration of oxytocin guideline report, our new implementation toolkit and a collection of tools and resources to support implementation, please visit our PCMCH website, as you can see on the screen. And I do hope that you can join us virtually on March 7th, 2022 at 12 to 1 p.m. to find out more about the application of recommendations and tools into your clinical practice at your unit or within your organization. Register for the webinar in advance by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thank you.